as an independent consultant for uh, EAS. Uh, this is going to be a brief overview on FDA's transition from uh, the uh, CFR A20, uh, which is currently required, to the voluntary uh, ISO 13485 2016. Uh, I'm glad that you all were able to attend. So, with that, let me get started with the uh, actual uh, webinar itself. Now, as everybody is aware, uh, this uh, regulation, which is voluntary, is meant to help all manufacturers involved in medical device consulting uh, issue, excuse me, with medical device uh, device and design control adherence. Uh, again, I can't emphasize enough, this is a voluntary. Uh, this is basically a regular transition that was developed back in the 2016. I'm going to basically go through some of the uh, issues that are already probably you're all aware of, but I want to spend more time with this voluntary ISO uh, regulation. And I'm going to also talk about how you as medical device manufacturing firms can benefit by this. Uh, there is a good rationale, which is why the FDA developed this. And with that said, I'm also going to give a summary and also leave some time to uh, have some questions. Basically, uh, the intent of this um, new ISO standard was to basically uh, harmonize the whole process. This shift is basically uh, uh, to meant to make your lives easier. Uh, I want to just sort of take a moment to uh, just to remind you, the FDA is here to help you all. It's not meant as uh, a hindrance, but it's meant as a collaborative partner. So with that said, um, this uh, new compliant uh, or non-compliant or voluntary uh, ISO is meant to uh, reduce compliance and record keeping burden because as all of you know, there's a lot of record keeping, especially when you want to introduce a new product uh, via the uh, 510K. Now, all of you are familiar with the uh, so-called uh, uh, so requirements for quality system regulation. Quality system regulation or reporting is a very important uh, uh, mechanism. It's also helpful if there's a strict adherence, there's a constant reevaluation to avoid any mods or any other adverse events that occur. I don't want to spend a lot of time with the regulations or the subparts, but there's several. Now, obviously, uh, uh, most of you, uh, I'm sure, can see all the slides. There's the general provisions the actual quality system regulations, design controls, which is basically based on the waterfall uh, figure that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, document controls, which are very important, the purchase controls, especially if you have third parties involved in your device and manufacturing. Now, you have to be aware that Traceability is a very important part, especially if you have a, a, a post-market visit or you have to prepare for one. Uh, production process controls are something you should be reevaluating anyways. Uh, as I said, this is required, but the idea and intent of the so-called uh, transition is to minimize your uh, record keep and create less burdens on the part of the manufacturers. Acceptance and not conforming product uh, regulations are pretty much understood by all parties. Now, corrective and pre preventive action. I want to spend a little time talking about If you do have an adverse event, uh, for some reason, and I'm sure all of you are very proactive on that, uh, you want to consistently be evaluating that with your QR test team and all the other people involved, manufacturing, your actual personnel involved in producing the device or system, uh, the labeling and packaging controls, if you utilize, your handling, storage, and distribution, especially when you're dealing with third parties. Record keeping, servicing is also very important in the whole scheme of things. You're going to have to be involved in servicing your devices. And you want to be very aware of what kind of uh, protocols you're using especially with maintenance and repair of your current devices or any new devices that you're trying to develop. Statistical techniques are a very big buzz phrase. Uh, all of you should be looking at all the issues related to 
for example, how many times uh, you hear from your uh, your, uh, your individuals, your clients, servicing your devices to? How often do you hear from your service tech? Uh, how quick do you respond to uh, complaints, et cetera? And these should always be statistically driven. Each manufacturer is obviously required to maintain a good quality system regulation. It's part of the ISO, excuse me, the quality system regulation that I've been talking about. Uh, you want to make sure that it's appropriate for a specific medical device. For example, if you have a class three device, uh, such as a pacemaker or an ICD, uh, you have to be a little bit more stringent with that. But that's not to say you don't want to be stringent as far as maintaining and providing new innovative ways to make it more uh, adherent to your FDA device control, even for class one and class two devices. Now, quality policy uh, is something that should be written and it should be adopted and understood. Uh, quality policy training is not a bad idea if all of you have not instigated. I would highly recommend periodic quality policy meetings with all your personnel, especially, obviously, it should be driven by your QSR team or your quality uh, regulation folks. But you should also get your manufacturing folks involved, R&D folks, uh, the people actually involved in manufacturing, and your organizational functions or responsibility for each division should be well defined. And if it's not clearly understood, that's the purpose of having uh, continue periodic meetings to make sure they're aware of quality policy that you folks are utilizing. Now, I'm repeating a lot of things, and I'm sure a lot of you folks are using this already, but that's not to say you can't uh, create changes or develop new things to make it even more uh, streamlined. Now, management review is obviously a very important function, but the management review uh, responsibility. It's not just on management, it should be uh, without saying everybody with your firm. Now, your quality system obviously satisfies the 820 uh, 20 requirements as far as the quality policy and the objectives. As I said, should be clearly written and understood by all personnel within your firm. The ISO, uh, the new voluntary regulation, again, it's a quality management system, and it's all, all, all it's going to do is help to increase your effectiveness as far as the current uh, regulatory requirements applicable to your particular device or system. The organization needs to implement it, maintain it as quickly as possible. I'm sure a lot of you folks have already done that, uh, and there's some obviously some bugs I'm sure to be worked out. But the quicker you get on board, the better your organization will be, and it'd be a lot more easier coordination communication with the FDA. Now, each quality management system needs to determine the criteria and the exact methods needed to ensure the smooth operation and control of these processes, which are documented in this particular ISO uh, regulation. You need to implement these action, uh, the actions necessary to achieve it, and you need to uh, maintain some kind of result-driven studies to make sure uh, that the actions that you've been utilizing are working. If they're not, you need to change it. You need to monitor uh, as often as possible. Uh, whatever your regulatory monitoring is, you may need to step it up because this is a fairly new uh, type of regulatory mechanism. Now, design controls as far as this new voluntary are not really different and mostly familiar with. Obviously, design and develop planning, especially if you're doing new device development or making changes on current existing systems. Design input, risk management, which is very statistically uh, uh, driven type mechanism. And you should have statisticians involved that are aware of how to evaluate the risks associated, especially with new devices. The design output, design review, that's all part of that waterfall mechanism that I referred to in an earlier slide. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free. Design verification validation is very important. It's always been part of the A20 anyways. 
this new regulation is not trying to re, uh, redesign the wheel, but it's to make your life easier and to make sure you understand how all these things play a part in uh, adhering to regulatory uh, uh, control requirements. Design transfer, design change, I want to spend a little time with that, especially when you're designing a new type of device or even making minor changes. You have to rationalize each design change, minor or major. Your design history file is something that you should be massaging in terms of making sure that it's current and that all of your uh, employees are aware of everything contained with it. Design history file is something that, especially with a uh, uh, post-market visit, the folks from the FBI are gonna be very concerned with. So you need to make sure that's maintained and everything's documented properly in your design history file, which is basically the EHR file. Now, this is this waterfall mechanism that all you should be familiar with. This new voluntary regulation wants you to continue to make sure you understand the interrelationship that's involved with all these design controls. It's known as the waterfall uh, design control adherence mechanism. Some of you may know it by other names or acronyms. Now, as far as um, audits, I'm sure all of you have been involved in audits. Uh, now, especially when you're trying to uh, go to a different auditing system, which this, in a sense, is. Uh, this is kind of the time frame that uh, has been developed for this new uh, voluntary uh, regulation. Now, a lot of the stuff you might want to look at at your own leisure. Now, some of the implications uh, are that, um, first of all, the FDA's intent is this is uh, basically adopted by all the manufacturing firms by 2019. Now, obviously, there's only three months away, and I'm sure some of you have not completely adopted the transition, but, you know, the FDA hopes that this will be done by the end of this uh, year. Additionally, um, the so-called medical device signal uh, audit uh, is also expected to be adopted by all the manufacturing firms, which is the previous slide that I talked with or discussed very briefly. Now, risk management approach is a very important mechanism. It's very statistically driven. Uh, you need to make sure that you're identifying all hazards. You need to document the hazards to determine the severity. There's obviously different classes of severity. Obviously, are more of a higher risk for the patients utilizing the device. Uh, the bottom line is you have to have something in place, something very similar. You always have to make sure that uh, you properly assign a risk level. You may need to change it to a different level. If it's unacceptable, you have to apply some corrective mechanism. Now, here's some of the so-called uh, risk zones. This is one of uh, many that's been uh, developed for developing uh, severity of your harm. Obviously, um, risk three is something that's totally unacceptable. Two, you can develop some mitigating, even though it's somewhat acceptable. Again, you're trying to streamline less than the risks that are associated with your device. And all of this is meant to uh, cut down on any adverse events that may occur. Um, and that's only to help you in the long run and make your devices safe to use for the patient, not just on a short-term basis, but a long-term basis. Now, this is just a fall tree analysis example that I found uh, on the internet, but this is something that I use. I'm a medical device consultant. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that, but you need to develop some kind of analysis technique with all your devices, whether it's class one, class two, class three. This happens to be a class three, which means there's a lot of potential there is the uh, potential for serious harm to your patient as well as death. So these are something you want to spend a little bit more time. And this is in relationship not to responding to a particular adverse event, but you should be doing this before a problem occurs with all your devices. Always be improving your risk management and your risk-based uh, decision-making process. You always want to increase your uh, 
validation efforts, especially computer software. Obviously, you're using different computer software, and with any software, there's always going to be glitches. Uh, all most of the uh, devices that uh, are very computer software driven really need to be evaluated on a period basis to make sure they're operating correctly. Now, you may you need to maintain and establish if you have it your technical documentation. You need to have it well documented. You need to make sure that it's up to date. Everybody's aware of this. And everybody should be allowed, especially your maintenance folks, to be very involved in this. Because, as I said, this is kind of a, uh, a document you can't be afraid to change, especially if it's going to prove it. Now, the new requirements of this transition are to make complaint handling processes easy. I'm sure a lot of you have had issues related to that. Uh, so the better you're prepared, the better your mechanism for handling complaints from your clients is. Why is this important to get it right? Well, with any kind of regulation, you're gonna have some bugs, but you wanna make it as uh, streamlined and quick to, to utilize and effective. Now, that's uh, where you may wanna contact or have someone in as a consultant to facilitate this transition. The steps to uh, your ISO transition, you need to evaluate your biocompatibility and sterilization assessments protocols. I'm sure a lot of you realize a lot of these are already gonna be um, well documented, especially if you've done a pre-market for a class three device. You wanna be consistently evaluating your process validation procedures. Uh, this is to uh, make sure that uh, everything is working properly. I have an abbreviation at the end of the seminar. Fortunately, with the FDA and uh, QSR, this is kind of like alphabet soup. You have a lot of uh, acronyms and abbreviations you have to be familiar with. Your device master record should always be available to the FDA, especially when you're doing... Um, uh, a post-market surveillance, or you want to make sure that your risk management programs and analysis protocols are being properly uh, implemented and, and are effective. I keep saying evaluation, evaluation, evaluation. So any kind of buzzword in this webinar is evaluate or periodically evaluate. Don't be afraid to change it. It's like a design control. Don't be afraid to implement it or change it accordingly. The quality management system criteria should be understood by all parties. Your QSR team can help the uh, different divisions to be uh, completely aware. It's gonna be some questions, there's gonna be some concerns and issues. Address them as quickly as you can. Your training requirements, you all are inherently involved. Training, and that's the second buzzword, training. Always be willing to train your personnel in all divisions, especially with the transition of this new voluntary uh, protocol. Now, this is some of the buzzwords we talked about. Uh, most of you are aware, but uh, I mentioned earlier about some of the new uh, uh, things that have to be available. Operational qualification uh, protocols, your performance qualification protocol, et cetera. Brian Coleman is indispensable. Uh, and I would recommend that if you do have any questions or issues related to transition uh, and you have any subsequent questions, you can direct them to uh, Brian. Uh, he's very receptive. Uh, he's trying to make this transition as easily as possible. I want to thank you for your time and I want to open it up to questions. Have a great afternoon, everybody.